yes, as I said, my name is Gijs Schwarzenberg and I will be speaking to you on behalf of the Thorium MSR Foundation. Um, if you haven't heard of it, that's okay, because we only exist for five days today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, but first I would like to thank the organizers for uh, having us here. It's a great uh, honor to be here today with you in Copenhagen. And uh, they announced the establishment five days ago, as I said, uh, of the Thorium MSR Foundation in Delft, Netherlands. Um, in April last year, um, Kirk Sorensen was presenting at the uh, symposium we had in Delft on April 17th. And he had this interesting exchange with our Member of Parliament, André Bosman. Where's, where's Kirk, by the way? He's gone? All right. Well, well, I, I'll quote him anyway. <laughs> Um, André Bosman asked the question to Kirk, Mr. Sorensen, how do we transform the idea about nuclear energy? If I discuss nuclear energy in the lower house, everybody thinks of Fukushima and Fukushima <coughs> Island. How do we educate people that this is a different type of energy with potential for the future? And Sorensen answered, I do not envy you your challenge. <laughs> I think your challenge may be much greater than mine. You have asked exactly the right question, how do we educate people on this? It is this challenge, however, that has been driving the establishment of the Thorium MSR Foundation. Um, education supposes learning. Um, I am pretty sure that each of the founding members of the <coughs> Thorium MSR Foundation, none of, none of us started as being pro-nuclear. Um, but all of us were concerned about the environment and the future of uh, a healthy and a healthy society. Uh, and we all think that we need to get rid of fossil fuels. So there's a shared perspective. And each of us thinks that this may be, uh, well, a very important contribution to attaining that goal. But um, educating people supposes learning. So each of us went through a learning process uh, and that started about uh, five or six years ago and it basically it started with sorry, this picture. Um, this, I, I, I'm pretty sure many of you have seen this picture or variations of it. Uh, this one it, I think is the original, it, it was in Scientific American in 2010 in an article by uh, Hargraves and Moore. It basically presents uh, two ways to produce, produce a, a gigawatt year of electric power. A gigawatt year, well, I'm with a room full of engineers. Most of you have a rough idea, I think, of how much power that is. But it's the power you need for a, to power a city of a million inhabitants for a year, roughly. So that would be Copenhagen, right? Um, to do this, you can do this in two different ways. When you do that with a traditional power plant, you start with about 250 tons of natural uranium. In order to use it in a, uh, in a power plant, you uh, enrich it to 35 tons of enriched uranium fuel. Then you burn it in a power plant, and after a year, you're left with 34, 35 tons of spent nuclear fuel, which consists of uh, uh, several components, and in, in, in reality, these are mixed. So uh, most of it is just unused uranium-238. And a small part of it is unused uh, uh, 235. Um, an important part, which I will speak later of again, is the ton, one ton, thousand kilograms of fission products and also a smaller part of plutonium. So that's the traditional way to produce, pre produce nuclear power. And now there came this new vision that was presented by Mr. Sorensen, how he entered the room, and by many others uh, who are also, uh, have been also engaging on this uh, scheme. And his vision was to start with one ton of thorium, use that in a liquid fluoride power plant. Out of it comes just this one ton of fission products. And this ton of fission products, after 10 years, 83% is stable. You could even sell it if you separate it. And 17% is, you know, you need storage for about 300 years, and that's basically it. You know, that's a very small fragment of uh, amount of plutonium, but it's really not, not in the practice, not a big problem. So that was the vision that was presented. And as I said, 
for each of us, this started a learning process. Because out of this arose a question. Could this be real? Personally, I was not immediately convinced, I must say. Um, I mean, if you search for energy solutions on the internet, you see a lot of science fiction coming by. And it's often not so easy to discern fact from fiction. So we entered a learning curve. And I think the MSR Foundation's goal, basically, is to shorten learning curves. We're talking about learning curves, uh, sorry, wrong way. Um, in April 17, uh, on, on April 17, two of last year, we had this, uh, yes, you're on, you're on the picture. <laughs> There's more people here on the picture. Um, in a way, it marked the beginning of a new story. A lot of, a lot of us, as the group, met there for the first time. And uh, it was a remarkable event. I think 250 people uh, gathered there, and it was a big event, and there was an atmosphere of real energetic optimism that day. So it was a su really surprising uh, event for many that participated. <coughs> and it also learned that if you meet the right people, that dramatically speeds up your learning process. Because in those years where I and my fellow, my colleagues have been searching the internet, you have tons of discussions, of blogs, of forums, of wikis, of what have you. And every time you're left with just that one question, I'm not really quite sure. You, you, don't, you, you never get certain about these options. And when you get a chance to talk to people who know things, then a lot of things start clearing up. And that's really... And that's really uh, uh, yeah, speeds up the learning process. And by the way, you also get your pictures that are shared around the world. This picture has got uh, around on Facebook uh, worldwide and it got tons of likes and comments of, wow, there must be the winner, future winner of the MSR race must be on this picture. <laughs> Who is it going to be? Well, <laughs> we don't know. And the networking basically started right away. Um, and what you see here is basically a process that has been lasting for the, but the last nine months, I think. I think it's still going on. Uh, but you see from this uh, messy networking thing, uh, out of it comes two basic structures. And that, th those two are important to us. Um, one, uh, start with the other one, is the uh, foundation. Uh, presently, there's the, in the middle of three uh, board members, Jorrit uh, Sonnefeld, myself, and Lucas Paul. He's also with me. And on the other side is Koen Groen, he isn't here, he, but he's a connection to the engineers world in the Netherlands. And we uh, want to build this out. Right? It's, not, it's not a closed network, we want to be center of an evolving network. And another important piece is the, of the scientific council. Because the, the experience we had of how difficult it was to discern fact from fiction, we really think it is very, very important to add real knowledge to this, kind, this type of networking. So we are very happy to have this uh, core uh, scientific council consisting of Jot Sietzema, who is presenting at the event as well, and uh, Jan Den Klosterman, you heard uh, Yuri talk, talk about him, of course, and um, Sander de Groot, who is working at uh, NRG. It's a nuclear research and consultancy group who owns the research uh, reactor in Patton, the Netherlands, a high flux reactor. And these three people already have a boatload of knowledge about all these kinds of things. And um, they also have, of course, large networks in this nuclear research field. So for any question, it's easy to scale up the knowledge network, so to speak. And that gives us a. And we have, we are sorting out ways to cooperate, the two of us. Uh, to well, so that we can be sure to bring out uh, knowledge that is checked and uh, controlled by people who really know what they're talking about. And that's the Thorium MSR Foundation starts mm -hmm. taking shape. And we have already been <coughs> booking some nice results over the last nine months. I mean, we as a foundation, we only exist for five days, uh, six days, I, I told you. Um, but as a group, we have been very active already. And one result was, uh, yeah, well, that was more um, a <coughs> row of videos. I had <coughs> presentations uh, in the country, and there have been, um, I mean, maybe five, six, seven of them. Um, there have been quite a few uh, press articles, and we are already being recognized as a center of, well, information. Uh, if people, the press, 
start writing about molten salt technology, they already now tend to come to us, so that's already starting to work. It's very nice to see. Um, another thing, <coughs> is a nice example of the previous, at November 5, I think it was, there appeared this item on television, uh, interview with <coughs> Jan Lane Klosterman. It was a surprisingly well-made uh, six-minute item, uh, and uh, they're basically explaining the options of storing <coughs> energy for a very large uh, audience, for a large audience. The item is on YouTube, and of course we made some nice English translations with it. <laughs> but the most uh, meaningful uh, result so far was that uh, the man who was present at the symposium in Delft, André Bosman, together with another member of parliament, Dijk Graaf, issued a motion, I hope that's the right word, that's the Dutch word for it anyway, uh, it's a basically a request to the government, uh, and the request was to, uh, to to check out this option, this option of thorium molten salt reactors. Um, and within four months, in the National Energy Report, there appeared this paragraph that the government is now officially supporting uh, uh, the, uh, uh, in, in innovation in a way in, in the direction of molten salt, or molten salt thorium and molten salt reactor technology. So that's a quite a striking results to reach in, in four months' time. The big question now for us is there's no wallet inside yet. And we are, of course, that will be our next target to provide that, to support that. So what will it be our next steps from here? I can only mention a few, but these are a couple. Um, one of our plans is to organize uh, uh, science audits of startup companies. Um, worldwide, I think, they're, well, it's a bit difficult. It depends a bit on how you count. A bit six, six seven, maybe ten, small ten uh, startup, very serious startups in the field of molten salt reactor technology. And all of these, uh, all of these startups are centered around. Uh, well, basically, most of them are centered around a core design concept. And uh, well, many feel that it is very will be very useful to get a first assessment by uh, yeah, well, by a knowledgeable uh, feedback group who can uh, interact on the level that these startups are, are uh, uh, required. And uh, well, the basic process is very simple. I mean, exchange starting with an exchange of documents, uh, starting with an exchange of concepts, culminating into face to face face to face meetings and. Yeah, having the designs getting a 360 degrees science checkup in a way by our um, scientific council. And of course this will be behind closed doors, there's a lot of intellectual property issues uh, at stake here so we have to arrange all of that. But in a way we certainly uh, want to be involved because we also want to grow our knowledge to be able to continue uh, spreading uh, information uh, at a level that also uh, yeah, is rooted in reality. We all want that. <coughs> One uh, step we are uh, soon taking, because the next release uh, is uh, planned for next uh, Saturday, uh, is, is our website. So the TMSR website is already on air, but it's now it's a very li limited version. Uh, what we are wanting to do is to offer information on three very distinct levels. One is a very accessible entry level, which just sketches the basic ideas and explains on a very high level the, the basic concepts and the possibilities. If you want to know more, you go to the next level, level two, and there you get um, well more explanation and also uh, with uh, uh, scientific references uh, attached to that. So you can be, uh, you make, you can start making your own judgments basically. There's a third level that. Well, that goes all the way of uh, detailed information and, and, and further uh, explanations uh, as necessary, with wiki-like structure. We only have the basics of that, but that is the basic idea, and we will be working on that uh, quite a bit in the coming time. Um, so, yeah. So, the, to the, the, the title of this talk has been The Nuclear Narrative. I want to speak a bit about that now. Um, the nuclear narrative as we know it is, has, be, has, has in a way become to a grinding halt. Um, 
Well, like the first reactions, when you talk, you, you, you say you're considering a nuclear option, for many people it's, oh, it's nuclear, no way, not going there. Um, it's important to realize that this nuclear narrative 1.0 has always been, uh, has been forming around this first uh, cycle, like its first option to produce this people with years. Um, and uh, I think what is very essential to nuclear narrative 1.0 was that it has always been a top-down thing. It was the basic, the basic thing about it is was people had the feeling that something bad was forced upon them. And that, that generates resistance. That's how it always happens. So, and I think the chance that this option offers is to create a new narrative around nuclear power. What I experience when I talk about these options, when people have the time to listen, and I, I, I get very few negative responses. Um, and presentation, like the one I showed you, was, uh, like for a, was for a group called Students for, Su for Sustainability. Sorry. Um, so, I, so somehow I expected a lot of resistance in that group. I think the group was almost as big as this one. So I really uh, checked in the option. But I got none. They were very, very enthusiastic. Even though I also mentioned the issues that everyone knew. But the only question basically was, why aren't we doing this? So that's important to notice. I think there is a lot of potential support for this option if it is, com if it is explained truthfully. And um, uh, I think that the option we are had, the, the vision we are being presented now, uh, offers a chance to create this nuclear narrative 2.0. And I think it has to be a conversation. Um, so it has to become a two-way thing. And we already see that emerging. Uh, it's very, uh, I think it's totally new to the, to the, to the world and, and definitely new to the <coughs> is that uh, uh, any form of nuclear energy is creating its own grassroots movement. It's a bottom-up it's a bottom -up thing. People are getting interested. It gets them out of their chairs and they want to, to know things. The essential thing then is once they get interested is to provide them with accurate information. And not only talk about <coughs> the advantages, but also talk about the issues, also talk about the problems, also talk about the real time frames that we're facing. Also talk about uh, how the regulatory system is basically uh, unfit for uh, developing this option. So if we want this to grow, if we want this to be real, there is a lot of work to be done. And not only uh, for the engineers like Kirk, but also for uh, regulatory authorities. And mainly, I think, for the public. I think it's very important for any, anyone supporting this option is to realize that politicians, you cannot expect politicians to be the first mover in this. Politicians are, uh, have their tongues frozen when it comes to nuclear. I have met those that are in favor of nuclear that say I cannot speak to this about this in public because I get opposition, I lose my voters. So if we think this is a good option, if you think this is a good option, it's important that you engage yourself and to have it, uh, have it move forward. I can keep pressing the wrong button. Um, and that's basically my message. <laughs>